everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's December 2021, and this is episode 267, which is a conversation about ministry to same-sex attracted people and a book review of the new book from Pastor Greg Johnson called Still Time to Care. Today's guest is Joe Dallas, who is the Program Director of Genesis Counseling and Testing California, which is a Christian counseling service for men dealing with sexual addiction, homosexuality, and other sexual and relational problems. Joe is the author of several books on human sexuality, including his most recent title, Christians in a Cancel Culture, Speaking with Truth and Grace in a Hostile World. Joe has written a book review of Greg Johnson's book, Still Time to Care, and it's called, Is It Time to Change Ministry to LGBTQ People? And you can read his article for free online at our website, equip.org. If you're a subscriber to our journal, if you do not already subscribe and would like to read this review, please go to our website, equip.org to subscribe. Joe, it's good to have you on. Hey, good talking with you again, Melanie. Well, Joe is here to talk about his review, as I mentioned, of a new book by a pastor named Greg Johnson called Still Time to Care. He also reviewed the new Netflix documentary about Pray Away the Gay, and we want to talk about both the Netflix film and this book. I want to let you know that he has written back in 2018 a very in-depth, I want to say almost 12,000 word series on these related issues, and it's called Homosexuality and Modern Ministry. And I want to talk about first the first article that he wrote, just for our new listeners. You might not have been with us three years ago when Joe was on talking about that. And part one of this particular series is called The History of Missions and Missteps. And this series was called Homosexuality and Modern Ministry, Examining Old Approaches and Assessing New Ones. And that's what we're going to be talking today about approaches to those who struggle with same-sex attraction. Part two of that series dealt with Revoice, which is a specific conference that um, was founded around the same time that Joe wrote those articles for us. And so we'll be talking about that at the end of the podcast. I also want to tell listeners that in early 2022, next month sometime, we will have an evaluation of the online 2021 Revoice conference. It was all online this year, and they had several thousand uh, people attend it. So first of all, we are going to talk a little bit about some of the backstory to this that was mentioned in Joe's article, but also mentioned in this book, Still Time to Care, and in the Netflix film. So one of the things that's mentioned is this ministry called Exodus International. So what is it about this former ministry that's no longer around, Exodus International, and why has this Netflix documentary and book taken issue with this? Well, the short answer, Melanie, is that Exodus International was a referral agency. It was a network. It's often referred to as a ministry. I guess I do that myself. But technically, Exodus itself was not a ministry. It was a network of ministries. It was formed in the mid-1970s. And it was a coalition of different individual ministries from around the United States, all of whom served people who were struggling with same-sex attraction. Now, that's different than an evangelical outreach to the gay community, which is also a very fine thing. But by and large, Exodus Ministries were ministries existing within the context of a local church or sponsored by a local church that worked with people who said, hey, I'm a Christian. I know homosexuality is a sin. I have homosexual desires. Therefore, I want support and guidance and help so that I can continue to live an obedient life and not give in to these desires. Now, these individual ministries were very diverse. Some of them were um, uh, affiliated with Southern Baptist churches, some with Foursquare churches, some with Episcopal churches, some with Catholic churches. So there was not uniformity in uh, denominational background or even in theological approach. Of course, there was an orthodox statement of faith that all ministries had to be adhering to. But apart from that, it was a very diverse coalition, a network, I should say, of different ministries, and Exodus, which itself was not really a ministry, was uh, a networking agency 
that kept all of these ministries in touch with each other and sponsored an annual conference and regional conferences to bring these ministries together. Now, since Exodus was the visible representation of these ministries, it took heat from the very beginning for obvious reasons. During a time when the surrounding culture was beginning to re-examine its views on homosexuality, the gay rights movement was in ascendancy during the mid to late 70s, why uh, there was a lot of cultural pushback for the position Exodus took. Exodus took the position that homosexuality was a sin, and like all sins, it could be overcome. Now, the word overcome is a very broad term, but my understanding of it biblically is that that means you have the ability to repent of a sin, to turn from that behavior, and you are given the grace by God to say no to the temptations to the behavior, and then on a one-by-one -one basis, people experience different levels of degree of relief from the pull towards that behavior. Well, that, of course, was an unacceptable message to any groups that wanted to promote a pro-gay view. So from the beginning, it had its pushback. But uh, as Exodus neared the end of its existence in the uh, around 2007, 2008, many of us who were leaders within the Exodus network or who led Exodus-affiliated ministries, we began to be uncomfortable with the position Exodus's leadership, again, not the leadership in our own ministries, but with the Exodus board, we were uncomfortable because we felt they were taking more and more of, if not a pro-gay position, at least leaning towards a pro-gay position. They were talking more and more with gay activists and taking advice from them as to how Exodus should be run. So many of us actually made an Exodus from Exodus. But at the time, there was a lot of talk about the fact that Exodus had done damage to people by telling people that if they were gay, they could repent and they would change. I believe that is an oversimplification. I think that in some cases, Exodus-affiliated ministries could have done a better job of explaining exactly what change meant when you say a homosexual can change. But I think by and large, both our positions and the way we approached them were on solid biblical ground. The leadership of Exodus, especially its director, Alan Chambers, disagreed and came into agreement with the gay activist and said, you know what, we are doing harm, therefore we're going to close down the Exodus office. However, most all of the Exodus ministries that existed at that time continued to operate and continue to operate to this day. So although the network closed down, the ministries themselves did not. So my, my long answer to what I hoped would be a short answer, Melanie, is that Exodus took an orthodox position on homosexuality. And in taking that position, it of course had to address the change issue because you can't preach that something is a sin without also preaching that because it is a sin, any sin can be overcome then you need to define the term overcome. You can stop the behavior. You can be given the grace of God and the power of God to resist the temptations. And on an individual basis, you will experience some level of relief from those temptations. Now, because Exodus took that position, it did receive, again, a tremendous amount of criticism. Some of it warranted, I believe most of it unwarranted. So that, I believe, is the, the sort of long and short of what Exodus was and why there was so much opposition to it. Now, I don't want to lump together the Netflix documentary and this book because the documentary was not done by evangelical Christians, and the book is written by a pastor who does hold to Christian orthodoxy around human sexuality. But I do want to ask, in particular, is there specific approaches that Exodus took that are critiqued in the film and the book, and how valid are the criticisms that are made? The criticisms made, Melanie, both in the film Pray Away, the Netflix documentary, and in Greg Johnson's book Still Time to Care, they are valid criticisms that I believe are overblown and overapplied. I think that it is the responsibility of every ministry to look at ministries that have gone before it and evaluate them and criticize them. 
This is something Greg has done in his book, and I think in many ways he did a very good job of it. But as you said, Greg approaches this from an orthodox biblical position. The Netflix documentary approaches it from a gay affirmative position. Now, the specific criticisms they have of Exodus, where I agree with their criticisms, I do think, but I'll qualify these criticisms with the words some or at times. Some Exodus leaders, authors, spokespersons did at times oversimplify the concept of change. Hey, Jesus set me free from homosexuality and you can be set free too. Well, that's beautiful. I agree. I would say the same thing about my own life. That leaves open for interpretation the idea that, oh, I I guess that means if I repent of being gay, I will become straight. That's an oversimplification. You need to explain that a little more carefully. So that is a valid criticism. I think at times the promises of change were made in ways that were too sweeping, at times by some. And in other cases, I think people were very careful. Now, I remember, for example, doing an article with the LA Times back in 1990, 31 years ago. I told the reporter very plainly, I have never worked with anyone who left my office after doing counseling with me saying, wow, I'm completely free of all homosexual temptations. I remember Bob Davies, the executive director of Exodus, was very cautious and even in a a Exodus newsletter said plainly, it's unrealistic to tell people that they can expect to be completely set free and never have temptations again. So I do think that there were Exodus leaders who were more cautious about that, but that's a valid criticism. In some cases, some people did overgeneralize. Another valid criticism is the overemphasis on psychological theory. I believe that there are psychological theories regarding homosexuality that are helpful to look at in some cases. Some of them can apply to either what created the same-sex desire in the first place or what contributes to it. I do agree with that, that in some cases it may, but every psychological theory, first of all, has to be judged by scripture. If it is contradictory to scripture, forget it, you reject it. If it is affirmed in scripture, then okay, we affirm it. If it's not in scripture, but it doesn't contradict scripture, then we consider it. Eh, It may be right, it may apply to some cases. The only problem is, in some cases, there were psychologists who came, Christian psychologists, mind you, and spoke at Exodus, and had very good messages on what they believed were some of the family dynamics contributing to homosexuality. Well. In many cases, the lights went on in a lot of our heads and we said, well, that's me, that's my background. Finally, somebody is speaking to what I experienced. And I think that some people went too far with that and said, well, then what was true for me must be true for everyone. Therefore, every man who is attracted to men must have had a problem with his father. Well, Melanie, that's not true. (laughs) I've known openly gay men and I've worked with men who struggle with homosexuality, both groups had terrific relationships with their fathers. But in some cases, those theories absolutely apply, you see? So I think that the over-adaptation of psychological theory and the eagerness to apply it to all people, that was a valid criticism. I will say this cautiously, at times, it may not be wise to get too involved in politics. Now, I'm saying that cautiously because I'm unapologetically at different times involved in political causes that I believe in, or or even in promoting candidates I believe in. Nothing wrong with that. But I think that you do want to be careful not to let yourself be used by politicians to get them into office. And then after they're in office, they basically say to you, adios, because I've had that happen to me and I've seen it happen to others. So, And while we're at it, I will say one more thing. I don't think this is brought up in Greg's book, but the Netflix documentary did make the point of saying, look, at times Exodus promoted ideas about masculinity and femininity that were culturally stereotypical. I believe at times that was true. And I think that, uh, again, you can't say that of all Exodus ministries. Anything you say about Exodus will not apply to all the Exodus leaders or ministries. But yes, I think in some cases there was overemphasis on For example, if a woman struggled with lesbianism, help her to learn how to look more feminine with better makeup techniques. Well, for heaven's sake, that does not address sexuality. Not not really. I think in some cases a woman might feel like, hey, that really helped me embrace my womanhood. 
that was a very positive approach for me. Well, that's great. But again, we don't want to lay that on all women or culturally stereotypical masculine imagery on all men. So again, there are valid criticisms that can be made. The question always is, well, I guess it's a twofold question. Is there any organization in existence that could not have valid criticisms made of it? Of course not. The question becomes, do these criticisms discount the basic mission of the organization itself, or do they simply call for the organization to improve? I believe in both cases, Greg Johnson's book and the documentary Pray Away, in both cases, they were saying that the criticisms, in essence, discounted the value of the organization in its entirety, and therefore the world would have been better off without the organization. There, I strongly disagree with both of them. Well, you might have been putting it off, but time is running out for you to enter into our contest for a free subscription to the Christian Research Journal. The contest ends next week on December 31st, and you can win a subscription for yourself or for your pastor or a friend or family member if you want to give it as a gift. All you have to do is write us a short review at Apple Podcasts, just a sentence or so about why you like listening to Postmodern Realities. You can just find us there and go ahead, log in and write us a review. We'd be very grateful. The other way you can help us out if you're not already a subscriber and if you'd like to subscribe, head on over to equip.org. A subscription is $33.50. It includes not only print issues right to your doorstep, but all the online free exclusive content like this review from Joe Dallas that you will have access to on our website if you're a subscriber. But if a subscription is not in your budget right now, please do help us out by leaving us a tip. And a tip would be something like $3 or $5 or $10. You can leave us a tip pretty easily. Go to equip.org, see magazine at the drop down menu, go to postmodern realities, you'll get to the main landing page. And at any one of your favorite episodes, if you click on those, you will see a link where you can give us a tip. And when you give us a tip, you help us to continue to bring you this content. You will help us meet our budget and we do pay our writers. We do give them honorariums for writing for us and we think that the content they write is excellent and it helps to equip you in your faith as you interact with apologetics or cultural apologetics and you're interested in hearing about the latest books, films, television series, and other theological articles and topics that we cover on this podcast. So thanks for all the ways in which you support us. So some of our listeners might be wondering, well, you're critiquing some of the critiques against Exodus International. Were you involved with them or what was your involvement? And you mentioned it eventually shut down and there was things that you were disagreeing. So what eventually led you to leave this network of ministries? Well, first of all, yes, I was deeply involved in Exodus. As I said before, I was an Exodus leader. I led a ministry that was affiliated with Exodus International from 1987 until about 2000, I believe 2006 or 2007, somewhere around there. And I served as Exodus International's president for three years. And I've spoken at many of their conferences, done a lot of work with them, represented them. uh, And I'm very proud of the work I did with Exodus, hopefully the right kind of pride. And and I I thank God for the time I spent with them. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity I had to be part of that organization. All that said, I did feel that Alan Chambers, the executive director of Exodus, did begin taking more and more advice from gay activists who either wanted to shut Exodus down completely or completely revise it and bring it eventually to a gay affirming position. So I felt that in many public statements he began making, uh, especially to the media, he referred to same-sex relationships as being God-honoring, that they can be Christ-centered, that they are following Jesus in their own way and so forth. Well, I can not only completely disagree with that, but that is an area of disagreement so significant to me that I knew I could not be a part of it any longer. So I withdrew from Exodus. Oh, I think it was sometime within the year that it closed, and uh, I started aligning myself with another network that was formed in response to the direction Exodus had taken, the Restored Hope Network. I still do quite a bit of work with them, but Restored Hope 
is made up essentially of ministries that used to be affiliated with Exodus International. So that was where Exodus and I had to part ways, and I, I hope we did so amicably. I made a public statement in which I said I thank God for the work that I've been able to do with Exodus. I bless and appreciate the leadership of Exodus, but I'm no longer in agreement and don't feel I can continue. So why did the ministry eventually you know, fold? And you mentioned a little bit earlier about this, but what led to its demise, I guess? Well, now that depends on who you're talking to, Melanie. <laughs> I think that what eventually led to its demise was its positions became too unacceptable to too many Exodus ministry leaders. So too many leaders were leaving. There was too much controversy brewing within the uh, circles of Exodus leadership over the direction Allen was taking Exodus, over the public statements he was making, over the influence of gay leadership that was now being exerted both over Allen and over, as a result, the Exodus organization. That was one reason. Another reason was, as a result of this controversy, donations started drying up. The people who supported Exodus, especially the large donors, tended to be theologically conservative, and they were none too happy with the direction Exodus was taking, rightfully so. Candidly, I would have withdrawn my financial support as well uh, if I had uh, significant financial support to give. And uh, so I, I think that for those reasons, the Exodus board decided it was going to close Exodus down. I think it was an arbitrary decision. For what it's worth, I disagreed with that decision. I think that it should have been handed over if Allen really and the existing Exodus board felt that Exodus had either become obsolete or had been, as Allen said, doing more damage than good. I think that the right thing to have done would have been to say, I am resigning, our board will resign. If, if somebody would like to take this organization over, they may. And I think there are ministry leaders who would have done that and steered Exodus back in a more orthodox direction. But instead, they decided to simply shut it down. And um, the manner in which they did it, I also disagreed with. It was done very publicly with a public apology, which I think left a lot of people very confused as to whether or not all Exodus ministries and leaders agreed with that decision. They did not, and nor did the former ones like myself. But that is, uh, to my thinking, what led to its demise. So I think some people who had been with Exodus at that time would disagree with me, and they would say, no, we closed down out of conviction, out of deep conscience uh, and, and conflict. We felt that we should no longer do what we're doing. And I, you know, I have to respect that because, Melanie, I wasn't there by the time it closed. So these, there were, I'm sure, were in-house discussions that I was not privy to. And so I may have it all wrong, but from where I'm sitting, that's my take on it. Those are the reasons I believe Exodus closed. So you mentioned that Exodus was more of a network than a centralized ministry and that there were other ministries associated, affiliated through churches with this network. So what happened, to, you know, you mentioned that some of them kept going. What happened to the majority of those ministries operating within the network? Did the majority of them adopt a new ministry style because of the concerns that Alan Chambers had, or did they continue on, you know, in the ways that you, you've you been describing how you've done your ministry over the years? Uh, yes, Melanie. No, they did not adopt a new ministry style or approach. From all that I know, and in, in fact, I wrote about this in the article you mentioned earlier when I wrote for the CRI Journal about the history of Exodus International in part one of that series, I did mention that the majority of ministries associated with Exodus continued to operate after Exodus closed. And by all accounts, they continued to operate with exactly the same style and emphasis uh, and form of ministry that with which they had operated before. No, I do not believe that Allen and the board's decision to close Exodus affected the way that those ministries decided to approach it. I think they just continued to do what they had always been doing. And this is why I say Exodus was not a denomination with a centralized governing board that was um, largely overseeing the approach and practices of each ministry. 
Uh, the ministries were very independent, each answering to their own boards, to their own governing pastors, to their own bodies. I don't think that they changed their approach in any particular way. So in the documentary that was done for Netflix, they featured former Exodus leaders in this very much affirming pro-gay film. So how do you explain their change in position and why they would be willing to be featured in this particular documentary? You know, some of them are really well known. I mean, they used to be people on staff with focus on the family that had struggled with same-sex attraction and then then had gone on to maybe repudiate their positions. And so there were some prominent folks, if people are in this space, that were on wanting to be on the record about Exodus in the film. Yes, and, and I think that the Netflix documentary, Pray Away, and especially the people you are referring to, are a real warning to all of us. Uh, I think that anyone can default back to a sin that they used to be constantly practicing or identified with. And I think that this is a good example. Just at a personal level, I knew all of the people <laughs> interviewed in that personally. Uh, some of them I worked very closely with, uh, very closely with over the years. So it, it was emotional. I still can't speak about this very dispassionately because uh, I still regard them with a lot of love and, and in many ways with a lot of respect. But Okay, this, this is always true, Melanie. You know, ask the person who has had a change of position why they had that change of position. They're going to tell you it's because they thought the issue through and came to a different conclusion. Other people will say, no, you gave in to a sin and now you are changing your position to accommodate the sin. I believe that that is what happened. I believe that in every case, each of these people had an ongoing struggle with homosexual temptation even as they were out publicly talking about homosexuality and declaring their freedom from it. In some cases, I believe some of them were honest about their struggles and they said, well, this is still a struggle for me, but I have decided not to give into it. So it's just a temptation and praise God, I'm able to live in that freedom. Others, one in particular, has admitted that he basically overinflated his testimony and said, I'm completely free, no struggles, no temptation, nothing, when in fact he had very serious struggles. But whatever the case may be, the thing they had in common with is that they all reached a point where they decided to say yes to these temptations, yes to give in to the struggles, yes to, okay, I'm going to embrace this. And then they did need to change their position to accommodate their decision. What else could they do? So now they're not going to blatantly say, I no longer hold a biblically orthodox position. They're saying, I have discovered that the truly biblically orthodox position is gay affirmative. Now that, I believe, is what caused them to make the decision they made. They again would tell you, hey, I came to the realization that I was wrong. I'm in better shape spiritually and emotionally than I ever was, praise God. Not only disagree, but uh, for heaven's sake, one of the uh, individuals um, interviewed and and featured actually in the documentary, a a young woman who was a spokesperson for Exodus. The film talked at great length about her upcoming wedding. She and her partner talked a lot on film about their plans for their wedding, a very large event at the uh, DC Cathedral, and about how wonderful it was that they had found each other and so forth. And yet, my goodness, within, I believe, a month after the film was released, they announced that they were divorcing. So in all fairness, there are variables to this that should be considered. One of them being the happy ending is is probably too neatly summed up at the end of the film. And I think that that is often the case. We've mentioned Greg Johnson's book. Greg comes from, again, a, a much more orthodox position. But the big issue I take with both his book and the next Netflix documentary They both paint Exodus with a very broad brush. And I think they paint their own, uh, and uh, not Greg, but I would say that the uh, people interviewed in Netflix documentary, they paint their own experiences with an overly negative brush about their experience with Exodus and then an overly positive brush about how they've now found the light and life is so terrific. 
Well, th- that would be my take on um, the reason these folks changed their position. So I want to move on now to the book that we're talking about, Still Time to Care, which I mentioned was just released this month, December 2021, and it's written by a pastor in St. Louis named Greg Johnson, who has come to national attention when he wrote a testimonial about being a pastor with same-sex attraction. He would call himself a gay Christian in that testimonial in Christianity Today, where he has always been struggling, but yet here he is trying to live out sexuality faithfully as a single man now in his, I think he said 40s, and also the pastor of a church. So he does have critiques about certain kinds of ministry towards same-sex attracted folks. And what are some of the criticisms he has of that style of ministry in his book, Still Time to Care? Well, as I said, the big difference between Greg Johnson and the folks who both produced and were featured in the Netflix documentary, Pray Away, is that Greg's position is essentially orthodox and correct. Also, I, in reading Greg's book, I found myself agreeing with so much of it, uh, as, as opposed to the way I felt watching the Netflix documentary, which was essentially gay affirmative. Greg rightfully calls the church to task at large for making it unsafe for someone who wrestles with homosexual attractions to be able to confess those attractions. And uh, I found this true of my own experience back in the early 1970s when I first became a Christian. It, It was basically unthinkable then to admit that you were a born-again believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, who experienced homosexual temptations and had to deal with those. And because that was such a forbidden topic, and Melanie, it was. Even in the best of churches, I believe it was. Because of that, those of us who had those temptations felt very isolated, very alone, and we did not have access to the same ministry approaches and, and opportunities that people who dealt with other uh, sexual or other types of sinful tendencies or temptations were given access to. And uh, what what Greg rightfully points out is that problem is still with us today to a point. I'm, I'm sure not nearly to the point that it was back when I was a kid, but still it is there. Uh, his, I believe his, his uh, most uh, overt criticisms of the kind of work I've done and I will lump myself in with the people he's criticizing because I was with Exodus International and still very much believe essentially in in the work that Exodus did. He believes that Exodus too sweepingly made promises of change. It raised expectations that people would experience changes in their orientation, changes which many people did not experience. That it relied too heavily on psychological theories that were either questionable in or of themselves, or that did not apply to all people, that it over-engaged itself in politics, that much of its teaching tended to shame people who were dealing with same-sex attraction. Those are, I guess, if Greg heard me say that, he might say I'm doing injustice or I'm oversimplifying myself. But I think those are the main issues he takes with Exodus International. He makes an excellent point in the beginning of the book that, hey, The church's attitude towards discipling people was care, not cure. I like the way he put that, and he's absolutely right. When I repented of homosexuality in 1984, I wasn't looking to change anything other than to change my life from one of disobedience to obedience. Now, I I didn't say, God, make me straight. God, take these feelings away. I said, God, I've sinned by giving into these feelings. Give me the power to serve you and to follow you. And when I went back into church and got engaged with the Bible-believing church, nobody tried to cure me. They cared for me. Greg is 500% spot on in saying the emphasis should be care, not cure. So long as we define care as including obedience, of course. We're not caring for people if we don't call them to do what all believers have to do. We have to say no to our ungodly desires. We have to say yes to godly longings. We have to be in the word and living a Christ-centered life. Um, But again, I I think that where he is wrong is both in um, too broadly uh, categorizing Exodus and Exodus leaders 
as having either promoted false ideas about change or misleading people or over finessing words to the point where where we left people confused. I think some of the examples he gives are uh, are correct, and I think many of the conclusions he draws are too broad. I think the the biggest issue I take with it though is not his criticism of Exodus, but his recommendation in light of that. First of all, I think he wrongfully categorizes Exodus and other organizations like it as the ex-gay movement which failed and now has left rubble. He even refers to those of us who still take the approach Exodus took as the walking dead among the church. And I think those are very unfair overgeneralizations. They're not accurate and, and they're not helpful. I think that in lieu of what Exodus's approach was, he recommends an approach that I largely disagree with, and that's the approach of the Revoice Conference, by which people who exist in the church as Christians and are attracted to the same sex identify themselves as gay Christians. I believe that is an error. They identify themselves as a sexual minority. I believe that's an error. They overcategorize their marriages and say, hey, if a person who is same-sex attracted does marry someone of the opposite sex, it's a quote-unquote mixed orientation marriage. Uh, I think that's an error. I think it's an error to overcategorize us, all of us as Christians, by whatever sinful tendencies we have. What can come across as a, a sort of a victimhood mentality associated with this that I think is contributed to by these overcategorizations and a contempt that I don't think those of us who were involved with Exodus deserve. I think that Greg's, some of Greg's remarks and conclusions, and I'd have to say some of the remarks I've heard from folks at Revoice were unfairly contemptuous uh, of the work of Exodus and other similar groups. So those are the issues I would take with Greg's book, but those are also some of the criticisms, valid or invalid, that Greg seems to have of Exodus. In a moment, I want to get more into the Revoice Conference because you did summarize some of your critiques of it back in your very in-depth article of more than 6,000 words back in 2018. But I want to go back to something you just said earlier in your remarks when we were talking about the critiques of the book in the book, um, Still Time to Care. And that is, you mentioned about promises of people wanting, you know, that they could change. So I guess the question is, is it wrong to tell same-sex attracted people they can change? Because all the issues surrounding same-sex attraction or any sexuality issues are deep-seated. I mean, I think people feel like, I don't know if I can stop watching porn if they're addicted to porn or the people who have just had this inner conflict. I want to follow Christ, but I almost, you know, some people have had self-loathing. How, how is it that I'm, I'm attracted to somebody of the same sex? So does it give off a false promise? Should we not tell people they can change? Is that wrong to categorize it in ministry? Like, yes, you can change. Well, what we don't want to do is put either limitations or mandates on God and on the work God does in people's lives. First of all, change is an essential part of the gospel message, but we have to define change a little more carefully. If you have been born again, you've been brought from death to life. That is one heck of a change. If you were living disobediently and now you are living obediently, you have changed. If you feel more aligned with members of the body of Christ and you are developing healthy relationships with members of the same sex and the opposite sex, you have changed. If your mindset about the sin of homosexuality is different than it was, you once affirmed it and you practiced it, now you do not affirm it, therefore you abstain from it, you changed. I mean, if uh, Melanie, if those were the only changes that happened in an individual, that's a heck of a lot of change. So no, it is not wrong to tell homosexual people they can change. If they are not born again, I would not recommend even emphasizing the rightness or wrongness of homosexuality. The problem is they are not born again. We want to talk to them about the claims and the promises of Jesus Christ. We want to see them brought into the kingdom. And as we disciple them, of course, we apply the word of God to all parts of their lives that are outside of God's will. But, and this is the big but, 
We should be certain where scripture is certain. We should be open where scripture does not give certainty. Now, just for example, Paul told the Corinthian church that those who practice homosexuality or adultery or drunkenness or idolatry and so forth will not inherit the kingdom. And then he said, and such were past tense, some of you, meaning that within the Corinthian church, there were people who had practiced homosexual behavior who no longer did. And he said, such were you, you are a former practicer of that sin. Now you are washed, now you are sanctified. Did he say that their feelings had changed? No, he said their behavior had changed. So Melanie, in response to what you said about porn, for example, if a person says, gee, I don't think I can ever stop using porn, they are wrong and we should tell them, no, no, you can. It will be hard, it's deeply ingrained, but you absolutely can stop that. That does not mean you will lose the temptation to, to use porn. Some people repent of the sin of the use of pornography, and they find that with time, there is much less temptation towards that sin. Others say, hey, I repented 20 years ago, and I still feel a strong desire to use porn, and God gives me grace to say no to that desire. Now, are either of them wrong? No, we don't want to tell a person you can never lose the desire to use porn, nor do we want to promise a person, hey, stop the behavior and you will completely lose the desire. We allow for openness where there is not a certain promise. The Bible promises we will be delivered from the power of sin. It does not promise we will be delivered from a sinful temptation, but nor does it guarantee that we won't be delivered. We have to allow for each individual to have their unique experience. So it is true of homosexuality. We tell a person who says, okay, I've repented of homosexual sin. What can I expect to happen? Absolutely, you can expect to have the power to say no to the temptation. Absolutely, you should observe the same basics we all have to observe. Be in the Word daily. Develop your prayer life. Be in church fellowship. Get some good mentoring. Be accountable to people. Seek God's will for your life and move ahead. Be open to whatever changes God wants to make in you, but don't assume that those changes will be the same as the changes he made in somebody else. Now, some people will find that, hey, I have repented of that sin the longer I abstain from reinforcing it through pornography, through activity, through deliberate mental fantasy. The more I abstain from it, the less power it has. And now, as I reached at a point in my own journey, I am feeling a specific attraction, sexual and emotional attraction, both to someone of the opposite sex. Praise God, that's great. But is that going to happen to everybody? No. And we should never hold up one testimony and say, well, God did this for him, therefore God will do that for you. Because Melanie, I know godly Christ-centered people who repented of homosexuality 40 years ago or longer, and they still have very strong temptations towards homosexual behavior, which they say no to, and they have never developed any sexual response to someone of the opposite sex. Why did they have a different outcome than somebody else? Darned if I know. But at some point, we have to also look at God's sovereignty and say, hey, he deals with people as he sees fit. So when Peter was talking to Jesus after the resurrection, and Jesus talked to Peter about his own future, you're going to be led in a way you don't want to be led. Then Peter looks over at John and says, well, what about him? And Peter said, hey, if it's my desire for him to go on living until I come, that's none of your business. Follow me. Now, this is what we need to be saying to every individual who struggles with same-sex attraction. God will change you in that you will be given the power to say no to the temptation. You will be given an abundant life in Christ. You will be given the body of Christ with which to develop relationships. Keep open to God to let him do whatever work he wishes to do in you. To whatever extent he wants to change your desires, don't expect him not to, but don't put a demand on him to change those desires either. Your part is to live obediently and to trust him to do his part. And that's when it gets back down to what Jesus said to Peter, follow thou me. This, I think, is the correct approach to be taking when we talk to homosexually oriented people about change. So you started talking about the Revoice Conference and some of our listeners might be, I don't even know what that is. What are you talking about? So what is the Revoice Conference? Because in part two of your series that you did for us three years ago, you said that with the dissolving of Exodus International, there was a void. 
um, specifically for, you know, different ministries to come together in a network to be able to minister to people more specifically with same-sex attraction. And into that particular void stepped the Revoice Conference at that time. So what is the Revoice Conference? Because it's still going on today. They had a conference in 2021, for example. Yeah, I think that Revoice is essentially a good example of what I would say, um, the wrong reaction to a legitimate need. I think that the closing of Exodus did leave a void. I think the Restored Hope Network did a very good job, continues to do a good job of addressing that void. Revoice, I feel differently about. But, you know, I feel about Revoice, the Revoice Conference, the way I felt reading Greg's book. I listened to all of their presentations before I wrote the article I wrote uh, for uh, CRI. And I was saying amen to so much of it. And so appreciating so much of not only what was said, but the attitude with which it was said that I felt like, well, I guess this is like a lot of things I take issue with. Most of it, I think, is good. But what is wrong with it, I think, is serious enough that it, it does warrant some, some real scrutiny. Uh, Revoice was developed as a conference to provide both guidance and safety and, and community to people who were same-sex attracted, with the difference being the way they identified themselves. It very plainly says, this is a conference for gay and lesbian Christians. This is a conference where we will talk about what it's like to be gay and lesbian Christians. We do affirm the Orthodox biblical standards, and we want to provide a place for those who affirm them, but who also identify as gay and lesbian to be able to come together. And obviously, the, the uh, objections that many people had, including me, was not to the first part, but to the second. The first idea, hey, we're providing a conference for people to come together and find safety and guidance. Awesome. Good. Then it says people who identify as gay and lesbian Christians. Well, that's when the alarms go off for a lot of us, because a lot of us felt and continue to feel that that is a twofold error. One, it is an over-identification with a sinful tendency, and two, it applies a positive term to a sinful tendency, which I believe is a serious error. It leads to what I believe is a minimizing of the seriousness of the sin of homosexuality, probably in reaction to the overemphasis of the sin of homosexuality and the, the um, needless shame that came with that in earlier years. So I, I'm probably not doing it justice, but in a nutshell, I think that's what the Revoice Conference is about. Well, you know, you mentioned terms earlier and, you know, and you also just mentioned shame too. And, you know, there's been a response to those who would identify themselves as side B Christians. You mentioned that term or use that, those terms, side B Christians, mixed orientation, marriage, gay. And the fact that they openly talk about, you know, ongoing attractions that they struggle with, because in their minds, they see it as an opportunity to increase the presence and decrease, you know, like, hey, we're, we're there are people like us out here, and there's so much shame and m mental health struggles, especially young people have. I mean, of course, there is the gay affirming non Christian uh, approach of you know it gets better for um, those youth that identify as queer or whatever. But there are Christian kids who also struggle with that. And so they like to use these terms, people involved with Revoice, because they see it as an opportunity to reach out to youth who feel condemned for having same-sex attraction. So they don't say, well, it's so much about me using these terms, but it's letting other people know that it's possible to have ongoing same-sex attraction, but walk faithfully with Christ in obedience. And so that's why they use the terms. Kind of like some people would say, well, an Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, you go there and you say, I'm an alcoholic or I'm a drug addict. And it's a way to find community with people who struggle. That's why you have a mentor there, et cetera. So that if you feel like the cravings coming on, you'll contact your mentor to make sure that, you know, you say no and you don't go take that drink or, you know, go and use drugs. So they're saying, hey, it's about us letting others know that they're people like you by using these terms. And yes, you can have ongoing struggles, but still faithfully walk in obedience with Christ. How would you answer that approach? Well, I would answer with a big amen to that last sentence you said, Melanie. It is possible to have ongoing attraction to the same sex and live faithfully to Christ. Absolutely. So it is not the openness that I object to. It's the labeling. 
The openness is important. Uh, I, by the way, would have to say Exodus provided a good deal of that. Now, some would take issue with what I just said, but I believe that people at Exodus were able to very openly admit, I am attracted to the same sex. Yes, this is a reality in my life. For heaven's sake, most Exodus conferences and most all of them included a lot of teaching on how to deal with same-sex attractions, what to do when you're tempted, what to do if you fall, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that that safety was there without that type of labeling. So I think that what, what uh, Revoice and Greg accurately speak to is the need within the church for people to be able to say, yes, I'm a Christian, Yes, I am same-sex attracted. I am attracted to the same sex. That's a temptation in my life. I want to be able to be honest about that without over-identifying with it or without making myself a special case. However, I believe that the labeling does lead to both the over-identification and the sort of special minority status. And I think when you start developing those types of categories, you do needlessly separate yourself from other believers, and I think it can lead to almost a self-congratulatory attitude. This is unfortunately an age where if you have a sort of a victim mentality or category attached to you, there is a special status that goes with that, and I think we need to avoid that. I think that it is better to admit the temptations you have without identifying yourself by those temptations. Now, for special support areas like an AA meeting, I got no problem with somebody saying, hey, I'm Bob, I'm an alcoholic, because Bob is not using a positive term for his alcoholism. He's using a neutral term. Gay is a positive term. It's not a neutral term. Homosexual or same-sex attractions, those are neutral terms. Gay is a positive term, always has been. And I think that while I don't want to get too nitpicky, um, Greg talks about people becoming word police. Well, I, I get that. And I, you know, I, I think that when we're picking at each other over non-essentials, then we're being silly. We're being pharisaical. But I think this is important because I know for myself, and I think this is true of many people, I felt a strong conviction that I was never, even when I first repented, never to refer to myself as a gay Christian, always to admit these are my temptations or desires to whatever extent they existed, but never to identify myself as a gay Christian. There's a difference between a noun and an adjective, and I believe it always should be uh, approached as an adjective describing what a person feels, but not a noun by which you identify the individual. And that is where I and, and I think many others take issue with Revoice. But as far as the safety factor, Melanie, you're right. What they are providing is largely a good thing. I take issue with the terminology they're using, the categorizing they're employing, and I believe encouraging when they offer that safe space. I think that's the problem, not the safety, the categorizations. So given that there's critiques of you know, the approach that you're taking and the embrace of a different approach as characterized by Revoice. Do you see a schism building within the Christian church over various ministry approaches to people who struggle with same-sex attraction? And if, if there is a schism building, what can we do about it? Another article that you wrote for us years ago was about people bullying those who struggle with same-sex attraction. And sometimes that can give rise to people saying very hurtful or cruel things to those who struggle with that. So how do we even handle some of these things in our churches? And do you think we'll eventually have just an us versus them over these particular ways to have ministry towards people who struggle with sexual issues? Well, in answer to your first question, I know there is a schism developing within the church over this. There absolutely is. Greg's book is evidence of that. My critique of his book is evidence of that. Um, I think that the growing controversy, well, the controversy that was generated by Revoice from the beginning is evidence of that. And I think that uh, even the endorsement uh, of Greg's book is evidence of that. I mean, his endorsements include some from conservative Orthodox believers who I support, am in alignment with, and think very highly of. Then he's also got the endorsement of Dr. Ralph Blair, 
who is an openly gay psychiatrist who for decades has been a vigorous advocate for pro-gay theology and gay-affirming churches and a gay-affirming viewpoint. And so it's puzzling to me that Greg would include the open endorsement of someone who is opposed to the orthodox position on homosexuality and whose organization always has been. But I think that's evidence of how different these approaches are. I think the growing schism, I don't think it can be avoided because I don't feel on issues that are essential, and I believe this is an essential issue, both the, I think sexual ethics are essential issues, and I think that orthodox versus non-orthodox approaches are essential issues as well. And so our schism would not be over the uh, standards themselves, but over the approaches taken in response to those standards. There is a schism developing, as I said. I am hoping that we can continue with reasonable dialogue to critique each other. I think it will probably end with an us and them mentality more than an us versus them. That's what I hope for anyway. I would not be in communion with people who approach homosexuality the way Revoice does. I could not be. I believe it is a very serious error. I believe they are seriously wrong. I'm pretty sure they would say the same thing about me, and I get that. So, okay, that's us and them. We can peacefully coexist, but we will continue to be in disagreement. If somebody comes to me and says, I wrestle with homosexuality, is the revoice approach right? I would say, no, I believe it is wrong, and here's why. I think that's probably as good as it's going to get, and I think that... Uh, in a way, when different approaches like this come up, Melanie, it's sort of like the question of who gets the bride. The bride of Christ, the body of Christ, who is going to have the most influence over that? Well, that's that, there's probably no group that's going to have such ascendancy that they influence the majority of the body of Christ. But I think that both groups will continue to try to influence the Christian population because both groups believe they are taking the right approach. Both groups believe the other group is taking the wrong approach. So there's going to be continued disagreement. I think that we all have to be careful to make sure we are being accurate, that we are being fair, that we are being gracious and reasonable, that we, were, that we are willing to affirm what is good about the other group, just as even Jesus, when he criticized the churches, said, look, I know what's good about you, and here it is, and I'm, I validate that. However, I have somewhat against you. And I think that's a, a good approach to be taking on this issue as well. Now, I know there's people out there that are thinking, well, okay, I, I hear what you're saying, but practically, now, so how do, how do we deal with this practically at my own church? I mean, how could my church be a safe space for those Christians who want to walk faithfully with Christ and struggle with same-sex attraction? I mean, how can that happen, especially when there is a lot of reticence, even today, for people to talk about the fact that they do have this particular struggle with same-sex attraction. Well, I think that pastors have to lead the way on this one, Melanie, and I think we need to be careful not to over-specialize this. How can churches make their churches a place of safety for anyone? Now, safety, you know, doesn't mean approval. It doesn't mean permission, but it means safety to be honest about who you are, what you deal with. And then if you're willing to submit yourself to biblical standards, how you can best live that disciple's life out. I think every pastor should make it clear to his church, hey, in this church, we advocate first and foremost the need to be born again. You must be born again. If you're gay, if you're straight, if you're trans, if you're a Republican, a Democrat, or a Libertarian, or Euro, whatever, that is secondary to the fact that you need to be born again. That's what we want to see happen first and foremost. Secondly, if you are a born-again believer and you struggle with any sinful tendency. In our church, we will never legitimize a sin, but we will never legitimize throwing stones at anybody who has sinful tendencies either. I want you to know that in this church, it is safe and, and even expected that you will confess to someone in, some say, in, in, in either a prayer group or one of the pastors or some of the friends or the people here at the church or whatever, you are okay, it is okay to say, I struggle with a temptation whether the temptation is towards pornography or same-sex um, uh, behavior or violence or drugs or whatever, we all have sinful tendencies. We all have sinful temptations, and we all need to bring them to the light. We don't want to over-identify by them. 
we certainly don't want to give in to them, but we want to be able to admit them and not walk in shame over the fact that we have sinful tendencies because I have mine and you have yours. We don't need to pretend. I think that's a general way of, of making the church a safe place. And then, of course, people need to live that out. Now, to what extent people are going to be willing to do it, I know that's going to vary from person to person. And you can't make somebody admit what they are dealing with. But you want to make it clear in the way you preach and the way you teach that it is all right to admit that you have a sinful temptation and that you want to be prayed for and held accountable and walked with as you are dealing with those temptations. That's the short answer to what I think we can do in our churches. We, we may, in some cases, some churches will say, let's take it a step further. Let's start an in-house ministry to people dealing with same-sex attraction. Fantastic. Do it. It's a great idea. Keep it biblical. Keep it simple and, and make it a safe place for people to deal with this. Uh, hey, I, I help churches do that. I think it's a fine thing to do. But whether they do a specialized approach to this or just want to improve their general approach to people struggling with sinful desires, I think that's the way to do it. Well, finally, on a much lighter note, I have some fun rapid fire questions for Joe for our listeners to get to know our authors better. So it's Christmas later this week. Are there any special Christmas traditions that your family does every year? Yeah, uh, Christmas Eve, my I have two grown sons who live in the area. They'll come over, spend the night with us. We will go to Christmas Eve service. We will uh, then go take a walk along this uh, part of the city where all of the houses basically compete with each other for the best Christmas tree light design. We'll come home, wrap presents, watch It's a Wonderful Life. And sometime during the holidays, I always have to have some space to sing my rendition of You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch, because that to me is what Christmas is all about. Well, and also it's New Year coming up just uh, the following week. So, you know, New Year's is always a time where people think through goals and resolutions. So in 2022, what is something that you want to enjoy? I want to enjoy the beach more. I live in Southern California, and it's a shame how I've neglected that. Uh, I want to see a good opera. I, I have never really sat through an entire opera, and I'm 67 years old. I think that's a shame. I want to enjoy more books that don't have anything to do with theology or recovery issues. I want to have more fun with my English bulldog. He's my best friend, uh, and I've been neglecting him terribly. Well, thanks, Joe, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Always a pleasure, Melanie. Thank you. You've been listening to episode 267 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest was Joe Dallas. He has written an online exclusive book review of the new book from Pastor Greg Johnson called Still Time to Care. His review is called, Is It Time to Change Ministry to LGBTQ People? And you can read his review for free online at our website equip.org if you're a subscriber to our print magazine. If you do not already subscribe and would like access to these online exclusive articles, please go to our website equip.org and subscribe. Mm-hmm.